Right guys, hello, uh, welcome to PK Sir Classes. This is your CA Prasanna Kumar, PK Sir. So we're gonna start with a uh, uh, revision lecture of decision making chapter. Now, uh, so many of you guys have messaged me that uh, especially with respect to concepts, you wanted uh, uh, a full in-depth revision classes with respect to decision making chapter. So here it is and let's start. Shalo. Now coming on to decision making, okay, what is decision making first of all? So it's a, on an average, every attempt it comes for 10 marks and I can say if at all out of generally, I prioritize chapters uh, when I teach my classes based on this. So out of 10, decision making will be seven. So which means it's neither too important nor it is unimportant chapter, which means you can say it's a, it's, it's comes under B category. Let's put it that way. B and A category in between are you able to understand. So anyways, so let's keep that aside. Let's get into the revision classes now. Decision making is all about taking decisions means what uh, to take decisions. Let's say we classify our cost based on variability in relation to base quantity means what you take a cost base quantity normally will be units. I've given in brackets that it is units and you see if the units or output changes, what is happening to the cost? Okay. If cost also changes proportionality along with the output, we call it as variable cost. If cost remains constant and only the output changes, then we call it as what fixed cost. And if both of them change, but they change disproportionately, then we call it a semi variable cost. So like that, we classify cost into these three categories and then use that information to take decisions because you know that when you're trying to take decision, fixed cost is irrelevant. Why? Because whether you take the decision or you do not take the decision, fixed cost remains constant. Therefore, it is irrelevant for taking a particular decision. Therefore, to take a decision, definitely you need to classify cost into these three categories. And in other words, this is nothing but decision making in a simple way, right? Also, we need to classify cost into relevant cost and irrelevant cost to take decisions. So what are relevant cost? Those costs which you consider while you are taking decision, we call it as relevant cost. Irrelevant cost means those costs which do, you do not consider or which you ignore when you are taking decisions, we call it as irrelevant cost. Examples of relevant cost or opportunity cost, variable cost, incremental fixed cost or specific fixed cost or additional fixed cost. Okay. Irrelevant cost means fixed cost, sunk cost. Fixed cost means here we are talking about normal fixed cost or we can also call it as absorbed fixed cost or we can also call it as general fixed cost or we can also call it as allocated fixed cost. Allocated, general, absorbed. All these things comes under irrelevant cost, <coughs> incremental, additional, okay, specific, they will come under relevant cost. So this is very important for you. Keep that in mind. Okay. Now let's have a bird's eye view of the entire chapter. What are all the concepts that we're going to see? Break even point, PV ratio, shutdown point, indifference point, further process or not decision making scenario, break even chart, financial and non-financial and ethical considerations when you're trying to take a decision margin of safety, limiting factor, make or buy. These are all the concepts that we're going to cover in this particular chapter. So this is just a rough idea. Okay. A bird's eye view. Now coming on to PV ratio. I hope you guys are aware of PV ratio. It is also called as profit volume ratio or contribution sales ratio. What is PV ratio? Basically, it is a basic indicator of profitability of any business. Now you might say that, see, why would PV ratio indicate profitability? Why? Because PV ratio talks about contribution percentage. This is the most important point that you have to remember. A small change in thought process really makes a huge difference when you are solving sums. Many a times people do not understand this, that PV ratio is nothing but contribution percentage. Suddenly, when you know that PV ratio is contribution percentage, all of a sudden when you start solving sums, the simple change in thought process will make wonders for you to solve the problems. Okay. So hereafter, whenever I talk about PV ratio, you just remember that, okay, PV ratio is nothing but contribution percentage. There is a matter. Okay. It is a basic indicator of profitability of any business. And these are all the formulas that we're going to use to calculate PV ratio. Okay. What are they? Contribution per unit by selling price per unit into 100 or total contribution by total sales into 100 or uh, 100 minus variable cost ratio. Are you able to understand? Variable cost ratio is nothing but percentage of variable cost. Now, you know that suppose variable cost is 50 and uh, selling price is 100 then your contribution is 50, right? Because contribution is nothing but selling price minus variable cost. Are you able to understand? So selling price always represents 100%. So therefore, from 100%, if you reduce variable cost percentage, in this example, I call it as 50, which means 50%. Then what you resultantly get is nothing but PV ratio, correct? It's a simple logic, right? Why? Because variable cost plus contribution is nothing but selling price. So when selling price is taken equivalent as 100%, 
then obviously from that if you reduce variable cost you get contribution if you reduce contribution you get variable cost either way are you able to get me so that is also one formula so variable cost ratio is nothing but variable cost percentage which is nothing but variable cost by sales into 100 pretty simple and so these are all the formulas for pv ratio contribution per unit by selling price per unit into 100 contribution by sales into 100 100 minus variable cost ratio or 1 minus variable cost ratio depending upon what kind of formula you have got if your variable cost ratio is like 60 percent then 100 minus 60 percent your pv ratio will be 40 percent if your variable cost ratio is 0 0.6 then 1 minus 0 0.6 your pv ratio will be 0 0.4 which is nothing but 40 percent so depending upon the necessity you can use whichever the formula you want then change in contribution divided by change in sales into 100 that formula also you can use to calculate what pv ratio at last you have this one change in profit by change in sales into 100 i called it as residual one means you should use this formula as a last resort last resort means in any question if i has asked you to calculate pv ratio try to use this formula this one this one and this one still if you are not able to get the answer then as a last resort you try to use this particular formula are you able to get me right anyways so let's say selling price is 100 variable cost is 60 then your contribution is 40 then pv ratio will be contribution by selling price into 100 which is 40 percent or 100 minus variable cost ratio variable cost is 60 so if you reduce 60 percent from 100 you get 40 percent which is nothing but pv ratio pretty simple right Shalom. now let's move on to the next one next one is bep break even point so what is break even point the first thing that you have to understand is it's a sales level at which a firm ends up in no profit no loss situation that particular sales level we call it as break even point very important so this is an equation that all of you are aware of from sales if you reduce variable cost you get contribution from that if you reduce fixed cost you get your profit everybody is aware of this but at BEP we know that profit will be zero when profit is zero it means that your contribution should be equals to fixed cost correct that's why I've put equals to over here right so if profit is nil then your contribution must be equals to fixed cost which means at break even point your contribution must be equals to fixed cost this keep it in mind this is very important for us especially when we are solving sums okay keep this in mind okay now we have a formula for break even point let's try to understand how this formula has come suppose selling price is 10 rupees okay variable cost is 8 rupees then your contribution is 2 rupees right let's say fixed cost is 1000 if you sell one unit you'll be getting 2 rupees into your pockets correct so which means you need to recover a cost of 1000 but if you sell one unit you'll be getting a contribution of 2 rupees to recover the cost of 1000 how many units you need to sell for every unit it is 2 which means how many units I need to sell 1000 by 2 which means 500 units I need to sell when I sell 500 units, okay, then only my fixed cost will be completely recovered. Then what about variable cost? Sir? The moment you are talking about contribution, already your variable cost is recovered. That's what you mean by contribution. When I say I'm talking about contribution, already variable cost is recovered. So my only worry is fixed cost. And now fixed cost is also recovered at 500 units, which means your total cost is recovered, which means this is your break-even point. So at this level, fixed cost is recovered fully and variable cost is already recovered the moment you are talking about contribution therefore total cost is recovered and this we call it as break even point now how did you get your break even point 1000 by 2 now what is 1000 fixed cost what is 2 contribution therefore your formula for break even point is what fixed cost divided by contribution per unit if you want your answer in terms of units if you want your answer in terms of rupees very simple instead of contribution you divide it with contribution percentage now contribution percentage is nothing but pv ratio Therefore, fixed cost divided by PV ratio will give you same break-even point, but in terms of rupees instead of units. Are you able to get me? Pretty simple. Chalo. Let's move on. Once your total cost is recovered, we call it as break-even point. Till here, it's fine. But at final level, you need to learn some important points. What is that? There are certain presumptions behind the BP formula. Now, what are those presumptions behind the BP formula? You need to presume that selling price is constant, variable cost is constant, Fixed cost in total is constant. The relationship between cost and revenue line is linear, which means uh, it goes like this. Okay, that's what you call it as linear relationship. Anyways, that's not that important. That's why I put an into over here. These three points are very important. What do you mean by that? It means, if at all in a question, you have been asked to calculate BEP, you should not blindly jump into question and then try to calculate break even point by using the formula that is fixed cost divided by contribution per unit blindly. Are you able to understand? You need to check whether these conditions are satisfied only if they are satisfied cumulatively then only you can apply BP formula to find BP now please try to understand that break even point is not a formula it's a sales level at which your total cost of both the options I mean sorry it's a sales level at which your total cost uh, is completely recovered are you able to understand so break even point is a sales level it is not a formula 
for our convenience we converted that into a formula are you able to understand so if you want to use bp formula then all these conditions must be satisfied say for example if there is a question in which selling price per unit is not constant it means can i apply bp formula in that particular question you can't suppose variable cost per unit is changing can you apply bp formula to calculate bp no suppose fixed cost in total is changing so can you apply bp formula to calculate bp in that particular question the answer is no but still you need to calculate break even point now how to calculate is a different thing altogether or able to understand but what you guys need to understand is that if these conditions are not satisfied i cannot blindly apply bp formula to calculate bp that is a point that you have to remember okay this will really come in handy for you when you are solving what sums okay coming on to the next thing here you have something called loss and i have written it as unrecorded fixed cost this is very important i told you na small small changes in your thought process makes wonders in solving sums so here also i told you that uh, you should be thinking of pv ratio as contribution percentage and here i'm again telling you that loss should be seen as fixed cost that has not been recovered or you will understand here after always remember whenever you solve problems you should always feel that loss is nothing but unrecovered fixed cost you got the point very important chalo moving on to the next one break even chart you can have a look at this chart so this is your fixed cost okay and this is your total cost why this is total cost why because it starts from here so it is inclusive of fixed cost so it starts from here therefore it is total cost and your revenue line starts from here obviously right and this is the area where your revenue line cuts the cost line from the below and therefore we call this as break even point okay and uh, before break even point this entire area is loss and this is profit area okay and this is your actual sales level so therefore difference between your actual sales level and this is your bp level so difference between your actual sales level and bp level we call it as margin of safety okay on y axis we take revenue and cost on x axis we take units so this theta we call it as angle of incidence so this angle of incidence is influenced by which one selling price and variable cost which means this is the total cost so if variable cost is less what will happen this angle will go like this so which means your theta will become more so therefore this angle of incidence is influenced by variable cost also this revenue line inclination is influenced by selling price so which means your your selling price increases then what will happen assuming that your number of units remains constant then uh, this this will go like this which means again your theta increases so your angle of incidence is influenced by selling price as well as variable cost so this talks about profit earning ability of your company so greater the theta better it is for the company and this fixed cost uh, influences your break even point so right now because the fixed cost is here your break even point is here suppose if your fixed cost increases and if it is here then your break even point also will increase this will be your new break even point or you able to understand so the break even point is influenced by fixed cost okay keep that in mind chalo next we're going to look into a concept called margin of safety what do you mean by margin of safety in name itself you have got how much safe your company is how much safe your means i'm talking about company okay so obviously safety is linked with profits the more profits you earn the more safer you are the less the profits that you earn the less safer you are it's pretty simple right the greater the profits you have the safer you are isn't it okay now what is this margin of safety to put it very simple this is what is margin of safety what is that sales beyond bp sales okay if somebody has asked you what is margin of safety what will be your answer sales beyond bp sales up and above bp sales therefore margin of safety is equal to actual expected sales minus break even point sales which means sales up and above bp sales is nothing but margin of safety sales so therefore actual expected sales minus break even point sales is nothing but margin of safety are you able to understand now there is a formula for margin of safety as well that is this one margin of safety in rupees is equal to profit by pv ratio margin of safety in units is equal to profit divided by contribution per unit now let's try to understand the logic behind this particular formula so what is that first let us look into classical way of calculating profit what is that profit is equal to we will take total sales we multiply that with pv ratio pv ratio is nothing but contribution percentage i told you so sales into contribution percentage will give you contribution minus fixed cost will give you profit this is a classical way of finding profit correct now what i am going to do is that i am going to change this particular equation a little bit differently how in the place of total sales i am going to take margin of safety sales so profit is equal to margin of safety sales into pv ratio i will multiply minus fixed cost will not come it will be nil why 
because fixed cost is fully recovered. How? Because I am talking about margin of safety. So when I talk about margin of safety, I'm talking about sales beyond BP sales. So when I talk about sales beyond BP sales, your BP has already been crossed. Once your BP has already been crossed, your fixed cost and all the total cost has been recovered, which means after crossing your BP fixed cost is zero. Therefore, your fixed cost is zero. So when this is zero, then obviously now you try to rewrite this formula. Fixed cost is zero. Margin of safety, send PV ratio this side, which means margin of safety is nothing but profit by PV ratio. That's how we have got this particular formula. Okay. Now, if you want margin of safety in units, then profit divided by PV ratio is nothing but contribution percentage. Instead of contribution percentage, you divide it with contribution per unit. You get your answer in terms of units. Pretty simple. Okay. Next. We have something called income statement, uh, you know, beyond BEP. What is that? When you take margin of safety sales over here, you reduce variable cost to get contribution. But because you have taken margin of safety sales, your fixed cost will be nil which means your contribution itself will be profit. So this is another important understanding. So when you take sales as margin of safety sales, your contribution itself will be profit. Why? Because your fixed cost will be zero. Your fixed cost will be zero. Very, very, very important. Right? So contribution itself will be your profit. This is another understanding of the concept. Right? Got this? Okay, chala. let's move on. Now let's get to the next point, next concept, and that is shutdown point. Let's try to understand the shutdown point concept now. So let's move on with shutdown point now. Okay. Now, what is shutdown point first of all? Okay. So try to understand that it's a sales level again. See, everything is a sales level. Even break even point is a sales level. So shutdown point is sales level below which you are not recommended to continue your operations or in other words, you are recommended to shut down. So what do you mean by that? Which means shutdown point is a particular sales level. If your actual sales is below the shutdown point sales, you are not recommended to continue your operations. Are you able to understand? Which means you are recommended to shut down when your actual sales is less than shutdown point sales. Now to take this sort of a decision where your actual expected sales or being compared with shutdown point sales and accordingly you are taking a decision. To do that, first you should know what is your shutdown point sales. Now the biggest question is how to calculate shutdown point sales. To do that, first we need to start with this fixed cost analysis over here. For the purpose of calculating shutdown point, we're going to classify fixed cost into two. One is avoidable fixed cost, the other one is unavoidable fixed cost. Avoidable fixed cost means you can avoid it, you can save it. So therefore, it is relevant for decision making. Unavoidable fixed cost means you cannot avoid it. Therefore, it is irrelevant for decision making. Means what, sir? What kind of decision are you trying to take here? Whether to shut down your factory or not, or whether to shut down your operations or not. Unavoidable fixed cost means whether you shut down your factory operations or you continue your factory operations, either way, it's going to be incurred. So why should I think about it? Therefore, I will ignore it because whether my decision is yes or no, anyway, in both the cases, it will be incurred. Therefore, it is irrelevant. Avoidable fixed cost means if I take a decision to shut down my factory operations, it will not be incurred. You can avoid it. You can save it. Whereas if you take a decision to continue your operations, then you have to incur it. Therefore, this is relevant for my decision whether to shut down my factory or not. Why? Because it changes. If I shut down, this will be avoided. If I run my factory, then this will be incurred. Examples are depreciation because of wear and tear. So only if you run your factory, it will be incurred. If you shut down your factory, it will not be incurred. But depreciation due to efflux of time, irrespective of whether you shut down the factory or not, time will pass. Therefore, depreciation will happen. Now, rent, it depends upon the agreement that you have with your so-called, you know, uh, the guy who gave you that particular building or the campus on rent. Okay. It depends upon the understanding you've got. It can be avoidable. It can be unavoidable. It depends. Right. Anyways, so this is clear. So fixed cost has been classified into two avoidable fixed cost and avoidable fixed cost. This is not relevant for decision making. This is relevant for decision making. There ain't a matter. Now, let's continue from here. Let's say avoidable fixed cost is 50,000. Just imagine that avoidable fixed cost is 50,000. Right, guys. So let's presume uh, that your avoidable fixed cost is 50,000. Okay. Now, which means that in case if you shut down your factory, you will save 50,000, correct? So 50,000 will be your savings. In other words, 
in ca inter in financial management you would have learned that saved outflow is deemed inflow so when saved outflow is deemed inflow it means when you are saving 50000 it's as if you have earned 50000 you will understand so when you are earning something i can compare that to contribution it is not actually contribution but we will call it as equivalent contribution that's why we will not actually call it as contribution we will call it as equivalent contribution so actually what's happening we are talking about avoidable fixed cost and if you shut down your factory you're gonna save this much okay and saved outflow is nothing but deemed inflow which means you're gonna earn fifty thousand saving fifty thousand is as if you have earned fifty thousand so which means we can say it is equivalent to as if you have earned a contribution of fifty thousand did i really earn a contribution of fifty thousand no but it's equal to as if you have earned a contribution of fifty thousand these are all very important, Nana, because never ever buy heart anything. Always try to understand the logics behind the concepts. Okay. So, therefore, I will consider this equivalent to contribution of 50,000. So, which means saving 50,000, avoiding a fixed cost of 50,000, it's as if you have, is as if you have earned a contribution of 50,000. Now, the next question is, if I have to earn a contribution of 50,000, how much sales I should have done? It is imaginary sales only because once you shut down, where is the question of making sales because you have shut down your factory. So obviously we are talking about imaginary sales. So I'm going to avoid a fixed cost of 50,000, which means as if I've earned 50,000, which means as if I've earned a contribution of 50,000. If at all I need to earn a 50,000 contribution normally, then I should have make sales. I should have made sales of how much? Divide contribution by contribution percentage. Let's say PV ratio is 40% in your company, which means you should have made sales of 1,25,000 to earn a contribution of 50,000. Are you able to understand? Which means saving 50,000, avoiding 50,000 worth of fixed cost is as if equivalent to making sales of 1,25,000. That 1,25,000 is nothing but shutdown point sales. So from the, from the concept, you can easily say that shutdown point sales is nothing but imaginary sales. Are you able to understand? Now, suppose if you continue your operations, let's look at that data. If you continue your operations, your expected actual sales is 1 lakh. You are expecting that you will make a sales of 1 lakh. And you know that your PV ratio is 40%. We have presumed that it has 40% for example purpose, which means you will earn 40,000 contribution in case if you run your factory. But if you shut down your factory, you will earn 50,000. Would you like to earn 40,000 or 50,000? 50, 50,000. Therefore, I'll shut down my factory. In other words, if you run your factory, you will be expecting to sell 1 lakh. Whereas if you shut down your factory, you are making a sales of 1,25,000. Now, don't ask me, sir, if you shut down my factory, where is the question of sales? It's imaginary sales. If you shut down your factory, you are going to save a fixed cost worth 50,000, which means as if you have earned a contribution worth 50,000, which means as if you have made sales of how much? 1,25,000. In reality, you did not do it. But that is what you have done. Imaginary. Are able to understand therefore this expected actual sales will be compared with shutdown sales and your expected actual sales is less than shutdown sales therefore it is recommended to shut down that's what is the definition here shutdown point is a level of sales which is 1,25,000 below which you are not recommended to continue your operations your expected actual sales is below that therefore you are not recommended to continue your operations you shut it down so conclusion it is recommended to shut down based on financial considerations again very important at final level, especially new syllabus, based on numbers. However, before taking any final decision, the company should consider the following non-financial factors. What are they? You should consider your goodwill. If you shut down your factory temporarily only, you are not winding up your company, you are going to shut it down temporarily with an intention to reopen it up. In the meanwhile, whether it is six months or one year, your goodwill will be lost. You will lose your market share to your competitor. You will lose your skilled employees. Skilled employees means they are skilled be Therefore, they are very difficult to recruit back once you have lost them. Your machines may get deteriorated due to idleness. If at all, there are any machines like that. And if at all, you have any perishable raw metals, they will be lost. They will be gone. So these things also you have to consider. This is very important for us, especially in new syllabus at final level. Got the point? Non-financial factors in decision making. You got that? All right. Let's move on to the next concept. So the next concept is limiting factor. Then you can ask me, sir, you have written constraints and bottleneck also here. I have written that is because many a times students are getting confused between these three, you know, almost similar terms. 
they are not exactly the same but they are almost similar therefore people are getting confused therefore i thought that this is the right you know moment in decision making chapter where you can really get a clarity with respect to these three particular concepts that is constraints limiting factor as well as bottleneck okay right so first of all let's start with what is a constraint anything that makes achieving your objective difficult than it would otherwise be is a constraint for example it's a, it's a very broad term means what it includes everything that's what i've written over here so what do you mean by that sir let's say you want to reach your destination you start from your office you want to reach your home which is around 10 kilometers away so your objective is to reach your destination that is your objective now what is a constraint anything that makes achieving your objective difficult than it would otherwise be which means anything that makes achieving your 10 kilometer destination difficult than it would otherwise be will be a constraint which means if speed breaker is a constraint because if there is no speed breaker your destination reaching would have been smoother your journey would have been a lot more smoother and comfortable if there is a narrow lane then because of that if there is traffic it's making your journey making achieving your objective difficult than it would otherwise be if there is no narrow lane things would have been a lot more comfortable same goes with traffic signal same goes with potholes so which means constraint can be anything that makes achieving your objective difficult than it would otherwise be okay sir which means limiting factor is a constraint yes bottleneck is a constraint yes constraint is a big thing it's a broad term it includes everything so all limiting factors are constraints all bottlenecks are constraints but all constraints are not limiting factor so limiting factor and bottleneck is a narrow term when compared to constraint clear now what is a limiting factor limiting factor is a constraint first of all bottleneck is also a constraint then what is limiting factor basically limiting factor means scarce resources anything whose availability is limited whose resource availability is limited that is a limiting factor for example mishnas availability is limited labor hours availability is limited material availability is limited that's why it is called limiting factor because it has got the ability to limit your production if mishnas availability is limited you cannot produce even though you have a demand if material raw material availability is limited you cannot produce even though you have a demand which means these resources which are limited has got the ability to limit your production that's why it is called limiting factor you got the point what is bottleneck it is also a constraint it is same as limiting factor we will see this in theory of constraints chapter so what is bottleneck anything that makes achieving your objective slow or limited is a bottleneck for manufacturing your product say for example there are three missions mission one has got a capacity of thousand units mission two has got a capacity of 500 units mission three has got a capacity of 800 units and you need all the three missions to manufacture product a or b suppose then because of mission two you are restricting your production to 500 which means mission two is a bottleneck in other words bottleneck and limiting factor both are nothing but the same so you got this i hope now this particular confusion is clear <coughs> uh, we will see this concept of limiting factor later in depth in depth in the sense almost uh, you know you do have an idea right now but how to use limiting factor to take decisions is what we'll see later right now just the difference between these three is enough are you able to get me shall now let's move on to the next concept what is the next concept calculation of break even point under activity based cvp method what do you mean by that very important concept so listen carefully normally the formula for break even point is fixed cost divided by contribution per unit so everybody is aware of this right break even point formula is equal to fixed cost divided by contribution per unit that is your usual formula what is the logic behind this formula total cost can be divided into fixed cost and variable cost based on the variability of the cost with the output so you take output on one hand you take uh, cost on other hand whichever varies along with the output proportionately that is variable cost whichever varies along with the output disproportionately that is semi variable cost whichever does not vary along with the output that is fixed cost so we know that so the logic behind this formula is you have classified your total cost into variable and fixed cost based on whether your cost varies along with the output or not correct huh? but any cost that does not vary along with the output need not be fixed cost as it can vary with something other than the output logical right that cost we will call it as non unit based fixed cost non unit based means these fixed costs vary with something other than units that's why it is called non unit based fixed cost non unit based means these fixed costs will vary with something other than units non units which means something other than units so the logic of that we are trying to say here is that just because a particular cost does not vary with respect to output straight away why are you classifying it as fixed cost it is not varying with the output fine that doesn't make it a fixed cost it could vary with something other than output other than units 
That's why it is called as non-unit based fixed cost, which means those fixed costs can vary with something called, uh, you know, number of setups. These fixed costs will can vary with something called number of engineering hours. These fixed costs can vary with something called number of equations. Are you able to understand? Other than units, they can vary with something other than units. So I've taken some examples over here, setup cost, which can vary with number of setups, engineering cost, which can vary with number of engineering hours, material requisition cost, which can vary with number of requisitions, inspection cost, which can vary with number of inspections. So all these are activities basically. Setup cost means it is backed up by setup activity, engineering cost, engineering activity, material equation cost, material equation activity over here, inspection cost, inspection activity. Are you able to understand? So after considering this logic, we will revise our BEP formula like this. What is that? Original fixed cost plus, this is also fixed cost only. But this is that fixed cost which will vary with something other than output. All these are fixed cost only, but they are varying with something other than output. Na? This fixed cost is varying with number of setups. This fixed cost is varying with number of engineering hours. This fixed cost is varying with number of requisitions. This fixed cost is varying with number of inspections. Therefore, number of setups into cost per setup, number of engineering hours into cost per engineering hour, number of inspections into cost per inspection, number of material equations into cost per equation divided by contribution per unit plus original fixed cost. What do you mean by this original fixed cost? that portion of fixed cost which remains constant irrespective of anything that changes means this fixed cost is that fixed cost which will not change even if the unit changes this will remain constant number of setups changes this will remain constant number of material equation changes this will remain constant number of inspections also it will it will not change with anything that's why it is referred as original fixed cost okay although original fixed cost is not an official term it should be called as fixed cost only but for your understanding i have called it as original fixed cost so that it will be easy for you to understand that's it nothing more than that or able to understand so original fixed cost means that portion of fixed cost which remains constant irrespective of anything that changes even if units changes it will not change even if anything other than units also changes it will not change it will remain exactly the same got the point right I hope it's clear over here. So with this, we'll wind up this particular session. Okay. Part one of the revision of decision making in the next session. Okay. We will go with part two of decision making or you will understand uh, too much. If we go at a moment, then it will be very difficult for you. Uh, so this is the entire concepts I'm going to teach from power notes 2.0. So if you want to buy this power notes 2.0 hard copy color, you can buy it uh, from our PKSL classes app. I'll put the link of the app in the description. If you are using Android phone, you can just go to your Google Play Store and search with the name PKSR Classes. You will find our app. In our app, you go to store column. Under store column, you'll find Power Notes hard copy. You can buy it and you'll get it normally within five to six days. And you can have that hard copy and you can follow our revision lectures. So stay subscribed to our channel. You can share this link to your friends as well because like this, so many revision videos based on Power Notes 2.0 is gonna be uploaded. And I'm going to help you in attacking your December 2021 exams in a very good way. Whatever the help that I can do from my side, I'm going to do it. As you can see, now the time is 4.11 a.m. I think I've started doing this from 3.20 a.m. in the morning. So whatever the time that is available with me, I'll create time and then I'll try to do this revision videos for you guys. So I'm with you. Don't worry. Okay. So if you want to get best out of this revision videos, I will rather advise you to purchase this Power Notes 2.0. Uh, it is around 299 pages. It's very handy. It will be very useful for you to revise the day before the exams. It contains concepts of all the chapters, okay, at one single area so that you can revise it very fast and go and attack the exams in a very positive way, right? Okay, so with this, we'll wind up the session over here. In the next session, we'll go with the remaining concepts of decision making chapter, right, guys? Thank you so much. Bye bye. Meet you in part two.